Dietrich Labbers. What's poppin? In this video, I'm going to show you how to couple quantum chromodynamics and quantum electrodynamics to gravity. Now, before you ask, I know that quantum gravity is not renormalizable. I'm not going to quantize these theories in this video. I'm just going to show you how to write the Lagrangians of these theories, and I'm going to show you the equations of motion for these theories. Now, most of the heavy lifting was actually done in a previous video, one called Sticking Spinners in General Relativity. Really, the only difficult part of doing any of this is coupling spinners to gravity, and I derived how to do that in this video called Sticking Spinners in General Relativity. So I'm just going to apply the results here. There are really two main points to this video. One is to introduce you to the concepts associated with coupling other field theories to gravity using quantum electrodynamics and quantum chromodynamics as examples. And the second point of this video is to show you what the complete gravity coupled QED and QCD theories actually look like, to give you sort of a complete documentation of them in one place. Hopefully it will serve as a useful reference. It's really just a practice application of such concepts and is going to be pretty laid back compared to some of my more intensive videos. Now for the math portion. The following treatment is in natural units. The point of this video is to introduce you to the ideas involved with coupling other field theories to gravity and to use QED and QCD as examples. This also allows me to put complete descriptions of the gravity coupled QED and QCD theories in YouTube video form, which will hopefully prove to be a useful reference to people. According to general relativity, the gravity field is the metric tensor of space-time and affects physics by including curvature in a manner that may be time-dependent and whose dynamics are controlled by the Einstein-Hilbert action. It also says that the fundamental gauge invariance of gravity is general covariance, which means invariance under general coordinate transformations. In four dimensions, the group of coordinate transformations is called GL4. An immediate consequence of this is that coupling another theory to gravity simply corresponds to writing a generally covariant version of the theory and taking the Einstein-Hilbert action as the dynamical term for the metric. According to general relativity, this gives the correct coupling to the metric. More specifically, a generally covariant version of a theory previously established in Minkowski space consists of an action that is invariant under coordinate transformations and coincides with the old theory when the metric is set equal to the Minkowski metric. Another way of phrasing this is that we are enlarging the space-time symmetry group from the Poincaré group to GL4. So one must take the elements of the theory that is to be coupled to gravity to transform under representations of GL4 instead of just the Poincaré group, and then modify the existing action such that it is invariant under GL4 as a space-time symmetry group and coincides with the old action when the metric becomes equal to the Minkowski metric. Generalizing Lorentz tensors to GL4 tensors is easy because GL4 has tensor representations of arbitrary rank. For spinners, this is a bit more difficult because GL4 has no finite dimensional spinorial representations. The problem of constructing a generally covariant Dirac spinner theory is solvable, but it's kind of long-winded. I explained it in the previous video called How to Stick Spinners in General Relativity. I will just apply the results of that video here and not rederive them. So let's get started. The transformation properties of covariant and contravariant GL4 tensors are as follows, where these matrices are of course just Jacobians. These are the transformations therefore of these covariant and contravariant tensors under arbitrary coordinate transformation. So you can see that there's just one Jacobian for each index and that generalizes for arbitrary rank tensors, whether it's rank 1, rank 0, which is just a scalar, and you get none of these. Rank 50, it doesn't matter. It just is an obvious generalization of these transformation relations given for rank 2 covariant and contravariant tensors. Therefore, if only tensors appear in the action, all one needs to do to convert a Lorentz invariant action into a GL4 invariant action is to replace the Minkowski metric with the curved metric, 
replace partial derivatives with space-time covariant derivatives, and insert a factor of root negative g, where g is the determinant of the metric. Inserting this factor cancels the coordinate change variation of the internal volume element. To get the complete gravity coupled theories, we just need to add the Einstein-Hilbert action on as the metric dynamical term. If we take the otherwise free electromagnetism and Yang-Mills theories as examples, we obtain the following actions. So we've got the dynamical term for the graviton in the form of the Einstein-Hilbert action. We have the dynamical term for the gauge bosons, which are now taken to be given by the squares of the field strength tensors, which are taken to be GL4 tensors now instead of just Lorentz tensors or Poincaré tensors. And we have these factors of the square root of negative determinant of the metric so that the Lagrangian densities transform as scalar densities under GL4 and the actions are therefore generally covariant. So basically the variation under coordinate transformations of this factor cancels the variation of this factor here. And of course we obviously have this formula for the Riemann curvature tensor in terms of the Christoffel symbols, and then this formula for the Christoffel symbols in terms of the metric tensor. In my How to Stick Spinners in General Relativity video, the following result for a gravity coupled Dirac spinner theory was obtained, where the required covariant derivative of the spinner field is given by this, where this is a spin connection and half of these sigma matrices are the generators of the Lorentz group. They are given by this commutator and the curved gamma matrices are given in terms of the flat ones and the tetrad by this formula. And then we have this relationship between the tetrad and the metric, which establishes what the tetrad is in terms of the metric. And we have this formula in terms of the tetrad and derivatives of it for the spin connection. If one then introduces isospin gauge invariance to this, and then adds the appropriate generally covariant gauge field dynamical term on, one arrives at the gravity coupled QED and QCD Lagrangians. So if we introduce U1 gauge invariance into this theory that we've already built and add in the appropriate Maxwell type dynamical term for that gauge field, then we get gravity coupled quantum electrodynamics, where this is the formula for the Faraday tensor and this is the covariant derivative for U1 gauge invariance. Uh, it's important to note here that we don't need to replace these partial derivatives with covariant derivatives because the Christoffel terms just end up canceling out for the general case. And that's also the case for the derivative terms in the QCD field strength tensor. Then if we vary this with respect to the spinner field, the electromagnetic field, and the metric tensor, we get these equations of motion. And of course, because we've got U1 gauge invariance and uh, GL4 invariance, which is also gauge invariance, we have the gauge group GL4 direct producted with U1, or as I usually say, GL4 direct U1. A note on gauge term sign conventions. In my video on deriving the QED Lagrangian, I use the sign convention I am using here. In my video on deriving the Yang-Mills theory and QCD, I switched sign conventions and then said that the opposite one, meaning opposite to the one that I'm using here and used in the deriving the QED Lagrangian density, was the more common one for QED. I looked into it in more detail and the most common set of sign conventions seems actually to be as follows. The above convention is the most common case for QED, but the opposite convention seems to be more common in non-abelian gauge theory so those conventions shall be used here. Regardless, it is just a convention. All it corresponds to is flipping some signs in the gauge transformation relations and is therefore fundamentally immaterial. Thinking back, I have used different conventions in various different places and will probably continue to fail to be consistent. So the sign convention I'm talking about, if it's not clear, is what sign you put on the gauge term in these gauge covariant derivatives here for the isospin gauge symmetries. So a plus or a minus for that sign right there, and then also this one here. So now moving on, uh, following that same process, we arrive at this result for the gravity coupled quantum chromodynamics Lagrangian, where we have this value for the gauged covariant derivative. I already explained why these are partial derivatives and don't need to be covariant derivatives, where lambda a right there is equal to half the Gelman matrices, which makes them equal to the generators of SU3. 
This is the notation convention that I usually use and have used in my Twitter posts and such, but this is not the convention that I used in my last video on deriving the quantum chromodynamics Lagrangian density. In that one, I took lambda a to be equal to the Gelman matrices and the generators to be equal to half of them. It turns out to be quite difficult to maintain perfectly consistent conventions for every little thing throughout everything I do. So I will always try to specify which conventions I am using in the particular document. So the group here, of course, is GL4 direct SU3, and the equations of motion are very similar to the gravity coupled QED case. We have this one for the Dirac spinners, the quarks, for example. We have this case for the Yang-Mills field, and then these are the equations for the graviton field, the metric tensor. So now you've seen the mathematical details associated with coupling quantum electrodynamics and quantum chromodynamics to general relativity, so gravity. You've seen how to apply concepts of general relativity and the results derived in my video where I showed how to couple spinners to gravity to the problem of coupling example field theories, specifically QED and QCD, to gravity. Hopefully this helped give you a clearer idea of exactly how coupling such theories to gravity generally works, and hopefully seeing these theories completely written out makes this a useful reference for those looking up the technical details of these two theories. If you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe. Dietrich out.